You're listening to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor, powered by BBBGive.org. Here we explore the motivations that form the basis of giving and service. We inspire generosity and celebrate the transformative effects that giving and service have on the human spirit and on community. The conversations featured on the podcast also uncover giving strategies that educate and provide tools to help listeners make impactful gifts of both their time and money. We hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast, powered by BBBGive.org. Give.org is the nation's standards-based charity evaluator, and it's your one-stop source for information on giving, and reports on the most asked about charities. I'm Art Taylor. If you've been listening to these podcasts, you know that we have guests who are doing all sorts of things to create social good and to make the world, at least in their own minds, a little better than it was when they arrived. And we try to use these stories to Number one, inspire people to take action on their own, to support organizations that they care about, and to do what we are kind of expected to do as Americans, and that is to contribute in ways maybe that government can't and shouldn't. Well, uh, we have today a person with us who's done this in an unusual but necessary and also extraordinary way. Our guest is one of the people who I would say gets most credit for what we now know as the direct mail fundraising industry. Now, he's done that through political campaigns and through movements, but he's also done it with charitable organizations. And I will tell you that many, many charities, some of those who he helped create, have benefited enormously from his genius, from his sense of how people think about supporting organizations and his dogged commitment to making sure that people are able to connect with the causes and institutions that they care most about. And that is my friend, Roger Craver. Roger, welcome to the Heart of Giving podcast. Well, it's a delight to be with you, Art. Thank you. Roger we can go back many, many years when you got involved in this work, probably more years than you want to admit. But first of all, let's talk about direct mail fundraising or what we sometimes call direct response fundraising. I want to know in your mind what the general history of this is and how it has evolved over the years, but let's talk a little bit about the history and your connection to that history. Well, in contemporary terms, the industry as we know it, meaning the use of mass direct mail to raise money for advocacy organizations, political causes, and charities, goes back to the mid-60s. There was direct mail before that, but it wasn't until the mid-60s that Organizations like Common Cause, Handgun Control, Greenpeace, others were created. And they were created based entirely, in those days, on direct mail. The traditional way of raising money for social change organizations and for a lot of charities was to rely on the giving of major donors, large gifts and foundations, and in the case of advocacy organizations on the labor unions and occasionally at corporations. But there was very little giving on the part of smaller gifts and therefore uh, not the type of citizen involvement that we have today. So it was the advent of 
advocacy organizations really in the mid 60s that brought direct mail to the fore as a major uh, channel for fundraising. And up until then, there was very heavy dependence on larger gifts. But on the left or in the in the extreme middle, as I like to say, the first organization that was created in 1970 was Common Cause. And Common Cause had a unique proposition. It wanted citizens to become citizen lobbyists. and They wanted them to pay $15 a year in dues. And that was the first of the modern advocacy or social change organizations. And it, it occurred at a time much like now. There, the country was bitter divide over Vietnam. The environmental movement was starting. White House Congress uh, was controlled by uh, the Democratic Party. And the, the nation was just in, in paralysis. And so I started with John Gardner, who was the secretary of HEW, who resigned over the Vietnam War from the Johnson cabinet. And we started Common Cause and sent out letters that started everybody's organized but the people. And within six months, we had 500,000 people. And on the right, uh, Richard Vigory uh, was doing that with Young Americans for Freedom and uh, William F. Buckley. So though that's, that's the origin of what we have today. And then that, that, of course, evolved into other groups followed very quickly, Greenpeace, Amnesty International. And as we moved along, the, what I call the Compassionate Cause nonprofits, Habitat for Humanity, we helped start that. And the Heifer Project, which was a, which was a long-standing organization from World War II, it began using catalogs and things. And so Direct Response built that. And so it became very quickly in the 70s the major source of funding for those types of organizations, the environmental movement, the reproductive health movement, the civil rights movement, the human rights movement, and so forth. Well, it's not every day that you get a phone call from John Gardner asking you to start something. And by the way, John Gardner is no longer with us. He founded another organization that I happened to serve on the board of many years ago called Independent Sector. That's right. And I actually chaired the John Gardner Leadership Awards Committee and have a wonderful photo of myself with John Gardner that I keep in my office. But John Gardner was a remarkable man. And it's not every day that you would get a call from John Gardner saying, I want you to start something. So how did you, what was your relationship with John? Why in the world would he ask you? Well, it's a very, <laughs> to, to actually join him in this endeavor. What was it that you were doing that got his attention? Well, it wasn't so much what I was doing. I was the development officer at George Washington University. And of course, in the Vietnam War, George Washington University campus was the headquarters for mobilization against the war. So you frankly, as a university fundraiser in those situations, you couldn't raise money in a bank vault. The students hated the faculty, the faculty hated the administration, and the administration hated everybody. You mean like today? Well, kind of, kind of, yeah, kind of. <laughs> so John had started a few years earlier the National Urban Coalition, which was set up when the cities went up in flames following the assassination of Dr. King. He had a group of fundraisers there, and they were all married and had kids. I was single. They didn't want to take a chance on this crazy idea that John Gardner had, that uh, he'd like to raise five, six million dollars a year, which was a lot of money in, in 1969 and 70 from people, a lot of people in $10, $15 increments. So they said, well, you know, we, John, we, we really don't want to do that. But there's this guy down the street, Craver, he's single and he probably would take a flyer on this. So that's how I got call. And no one had ever done this before. And so I remember going around Washington. I talked to David Broder, who was the political columnist at the Washington Post. And David said to me, you know, tell Gardner he's crazy. And I went down to the AFL-CIO and Al Barkin, who was the political director, said, no, no. He said, John Gardner's nuts. He said, this isn't going to work. Well, no one had ever used mail for that purpose. Fortunately, on the board of the Urban Coalition was Andrew Heiskell, who was the publisher of Time. 
so time sports illustrated people all those magazines so i went to new york and he sat me down with the heads of each of those magazines at a big conference room in rockefeller center i'll never forget it and said now tell these guys what you want to do and i explained to them we need to raise this kind of money in small gifts and so the these executives put their uh, direct mail folks in my corner and they helped us figure out how to do this and so common cause became the first of the modern advocacy organizations to use direct mail and it was a it was a learning process for all of us there weren't things like there are today there weren't computer systems that are that were very sophisticated there were there were no places to have envelopes open gardner and i used to open those sunday mornings on the living room floor of his house wow so all the infrastructure we have today for this industry didn't exist then. So that was all figure it out as you go. It's the rest is history. I mean, these organizations grew very quickly in a two year period. We helped start Ralph Nader's Public Citizen, National Abortion Rights Action League, Handgun Control, Greenpeace, Amnesty International. They all were the products of direct mail. And then and you say Richard was doing the same thing on the conservative side. Just to- yeah. yeah, yeah. He was building his company on the right, and, and I was dealing with the center and the center left. And, you know, in those days, no one had gone to school to learn how to be a direct response marketer, or, or really not many had ever gone to school to learn how to be a fundraiser. So it was all a sort of an apprentice craft. And so we had to teach each other, then teach a generation of people to, to do this stuff. So it, it, people, I used to, I guess, maybe 10 years into the business, someone said to me, you know, it, is this hard work? Is it, does it really matter? And I said, well, let me let me say say this. When I came to Washington, you couldn't swim in the Potomac River because it was too polluted. They had signs warning of uh, hepatitis all along the river bank. Woman couldn't uh, work for an airline if she was married or pregnant. Women getting out of college couldn't get credit cards because the banks and the credit card companies required that either their father or a husband sign for it. So there it simply was a different world in 1970, and look where we've come. We, today we all feel we haven't come far enough, and we haven't. But given where things were, it was citizens, caring citizens, who got involved in making change that accomplished all this. And the, the change won't come from the government itself. Your introduction, Art, is absolutely right. If, if we ever needed caring citizens... It's in times like this. Folks simply have to get involved and support these causes that advance agendas that they believe in. So, Roger, let's go back then to the 1970s, early 1970s, late 1960s, as you say, when this really began to take hold. But it was also, seems, it seems to me, around the time that United Way donations really picked up in the workplace and maybe the combined federal campaign as well. And so you had these three massive engines of philanthropy that were getting started that really created the infrastructure for fundraising on a, I would say, in a distributed way so that the average person could find a way to make a gift to their favorite organization. And I wonder what's happened to those those tools. I mean, are we still in a situation where the direct response fundraising has the same impact that it did at its height? And by the way, I'd like to know at its height, what were we talking about in terms of donations, number amounts of money and total donations, if you can remember that. And where are we today? Have we gone up, down, or are people responding to mail in the same way that they were? Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's very interesting. A lot of people say they don't like or don't uh, respond to direct mail, yet it it continues to be the main workhorse of most of the big charities and the advocacy organizations. And in, in fact, even in the commercial world, direct mail, mail itself, the postal mail, has seen about a 43% increase year over year in the commercial world. The nonprofit world has tended to move toward digital 
more and more because they think it's free or cheap, but it doesn't really work very well. It, it accounts for about 13% of the small gift money raised in the United States. So it, it's important as a communications tool. There's no doubt about that in terms of the digital channel. But in terms of being a fundraiser, it's, it's not the only channel that sh- should be used. But it, in the 70s art, it probably, I would say somewhere around 100, 100 and $10 million a year was raised by direct response. This year, it's closer to 250, uh, 250 million. million. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. So that's serious money. I mean. Oh, yeah. And yeah. again, it gives people that opportunity to to contribute to causes that they care about. Well, now, yeah. And, and the interesting thing, folks think, well, the millennials and the Gen Z don't like it, but that's not true. It works across generations equally well. Older people tend to to send checks in through the mail, whereas younger people tend to use the mail to to get their information and to be motivated, and then they go online and make the transaction. So that it's a sort of a multi-channel way folks give these days. Yeah, I remember looking at a study some years ago, and I, I can't remember the exact people who did the study, but they were decrying the end of the post office <laughs> yeah. because the number of pieces, this is in the early, two, well, about 2014, 2012, somewhere around there. And they were talking about the end of the postal service because the number of mailed pieces had declined precipitously and that the post office needed to figure out how it was going to move forward. And we were seeing, uh, we were concerned, I guess, that the digitization of communications was taking away the need for us to mail things. But it doesn't appear that, well, it certainly hasn't appeared that the the demise of the Postal Service has happened. If I look at my mailbox every day, uh, it's always jammed with stuff. So I think sellers and Charities, too, are among probably the most robust mailers that you can find, right? I mean, I know that the direct mail industry, both commercially and nonprofit, has pretty much kept the post office uh, operating. And and now it, the other source of significant revenue is the parcel carrying that they do for e-commerce people, Amazon and the yeah. others, it's still a vital organization in our society. I mean, you can't, uh, you really can't do with without it, principally because it's a democratizing institution. I mean, it's everywhere. And just, just as direct response, direct mail, digital is, is also democratizing because the, none of these organizations rely heavily or entirely depends on the organization on really big major gifts, which could, you know, the danger of sort of inequality in giving is that the the huge gifts can often control the agenda of an organization. And, and so it's really to be hoped on, on at least the social change organizations that more and more people get involved because it, it really makes for a, a democratic, a small d way of, of operating these organizations. Now, I want to get into a little bit about how charities manage donors and the contributions, because I know we always get letters from people saying, how do I get off a charity's mailing list? You know, so you have a person who makes a donation to a charity And suddenly they feel like they're getting bombarded by other organizations. And what I say to them is, well, understand that your donation to that particular charity is only a part of its fundraising program. Another part of it is for them to find others (laughs) who they can mail to and make those donations. And a lot of times the way that's done is when charities can share their mailing lists with others who they believe you might be interested in supporting. And that is also a way for them to generate the resources that they need. So, but how does that whole process work internally in a charitable organization, Roger? In a well-run, a well-run charity who cares about its donors 
will be very careful how it uses its donors' names and addresses. It will not use them willy-nilly. It will, it will be very careful. And under the new newer privacy laws, every charity really should be asking its donors whether or not they can use their name for other purposes and give the donor a chance to opt in or opt out to allow their name to be used. Most charities are reasonably careful with that. Some are not, and that's what creates a lot of the abuse. But the abuse in direct mail art is nowhere nearly as abusive as the digital channel. Uh, mm. their, their organizations email far too much stuff. In the political realm, it's gotten really disgusting. The Princeton University track uh, has a has a political monitoring system that that watches the amount of digital mail. The average donor to either political party has his or her name exchanged three hundred and fifty one times a year. What? So that's an abusive process. So organizations really have to pay attention to their most valuable asset, which is their donors. And they have to respect them and give them the uh, the right to get in or get out. The average American with a college education is on 19 mailing lists for money giving. And so it, you get in this problem where organizations who, who are abusive of that just wreck it for, for everybody else. It's not a healthy system, and it depends on the ability of, of nonprofits to monitor their, their own behavior. So a, a well-run nonprofit will be very careful with that. It treasures its donors. It husbands them. It won't be abusive. So we talk a lot, Roger, about the cost of fundraising. Somehow or another, that became a thing for the average donor to pay some attention to, right? We always care about two things, the cost of fundraising and how much money is actually going to cause. Now, I know, and you know, too, that there are <laughs> charities that spend very little amounts on administration and still don't accomplish anything. And there are others that spend more and accomplish more on fundraising and administration and accomplish a lot more. But we know one thing, you can't fundraise if you don't spend some money. How do we communicate, Roger, at least in your opinion, with people who are obsessively concerned about this cost of fundraising? What do we tell them in terms of how much a charity can raise for the amount invested? First of all, I think it's important to recognize that most people are not obsessively concerned with the cost of fundraising. If a, if a person is a contributor to an organization, generally there's a, there's a modicum of trust there that they believe the organization will manage its affairs properly and the, basically the donor gives the organization its proxy. In situations where there is a great deal of abuse, the money isn't necessarily being spent on costs. It's the fact that it's not being spent on program and it's going to pay fees and fundraising fees and that sort of thing. So there, there, there is an attempt historically to try to measure the cost of fundraising. But as you correctly noted, Art, that doesn't say much because an organization that might be able to spend 10% but not raise much money and, and therefore not accomplish much, whereas an organization that spends 30% and, and invests it wisely in getting additional money may be able to put millions into program efforts. So the use of a number for fundraising, which is what a lot of the state regulators look at, is not the best way to look at that. The best way to look at a charity is, is it accomplishing its mission and is it a good steward of money, which is usually the same thing. If, if an organization is getting results, that means it's using its resources wisely. Yeah, well, I'll tell you that, you know, we do evaluations of some of the world's most recognizable charities. And I'll tell you, very few of them have trouble meeting our standard relative to cost of fundraising. Most of them can live within our limits for what we require there. And so for those who are obsessed about that, 
relax somewhat. You can relax somewhat in the knowledge that not most charities aren't abusing you. Now, we do have to pay attention to some outliers. There are some organizations, a handful, not a handful, but we don't know how many, but there's some out there that will abuse donors. They set up fictitious organizations that are simply there to get your money and pay for the mail shops and other things that they've created. Ultimately, that money goes to line their pockets. But those are very, very few. We, we very rarely hear about those kinds of organizations, yet when we do, they capture the attention of the media and the public and make us question you know, what we're doing. I think it's really important to help people distinguish between what the reality is <laughs> and what is actually in some people's minds about how direct mail fundraising and fundraising in general works. You have to spend some money to raise money so that you can accomplish your cause. You just don't want to see people abusing it. That's right. A good part of that money is is really communication to let the public know what the work of the organization is, what the need is, how it solves problems. And that does cost money, whether you're doing it by mail or newspaper advertising or television advertising or, or even video on the internet. It, there is a cost to doing that. Now, there's also a difference between a new organization that has to spend a disproportionate amount of money to get organized and get known publicly, as opposed to an organization that's 50 years or 100 years old that has a well-established public presence. So there are all, they're all sorts of variables, whether an organization deals with a controversial issue. Controversial issues tend to be tougher to raise money on than uh, non-controversial issues. So there are lots of factors. And I think the rule I use as a donor is, is this organization responsive to what I ask it? Does it answer my questions? For example, has it been accredited by the Wise Giving Alliance? That's an important uh, indicia because uh, the, the, the alliance doesn't just look at the cost of fundraising. It looks at the transparency, the governance, the other far more important factors in whether a charity is operating properly. So I think a, a wise donor will do a bit of homework and understand pretty quickly whether an organization is above board and getting results. Let me ask you this, Roger. So we, we talk about different types of people, different demographics, let's say. Let's talk about people from, I guess they call it the great generation. You have baby boomers, then you have Gen X, I guess it is, and millennials, and now Gen Z. And so I guess my question is, you know, some there were some people who said that if you can expect that older people will be ones giving through the mail or giving to charities responding to direct mail pieces because they tend to be home. Yeah, no, that. But what you're saying is that's not necessarily true. You're seeing that now all generations are actually responding to mail. That was a concern some time ago because we, we saw the digital thing coming along and we said, my goodness, if people can just get their communications via this, why in the world would anybody ever go to their post office, right? Why would anybody ever go to their mailbox? Why would anybody ever send anything through the mail? But as we just mentioned, people are continuing to send pe things through the mail and people are responding. So it's not a function of age. It's a function of what? Where age enters into it is not the medium of mail versus digital. Age enters into how generally how much and how willing you are to give. A young donor in the in fundraising world is someone who's 50 years old. There's this, there's this belief that every organization worries all our donors are getting older and older. But the, the fact of the matter is th that age is a big determinant of how much social responsibility you want to take on and your ability to take it on. I mean, after all, most people have pretty heavy obligations until they get into their late 40s, early 50s, yeah. and the kids go off to college. But 
there are plenty of young people who give money and give regularly a monthly giving, which has become a, a big thing. And you had a podcast a while back on on this installment giving where, where basically there's companies forming now that are give now, pay later type of basis. And that encourages giving among younger people who don't have ready uh, cash to make perhaps as big a gift as they'd like to. So there, there are all kinds of different ways to give now. So mail is mail is one of them. But in, in terms of age and direct mail, there there's, is no difference basically between the generations. Well, do you think that there is any difference between people who want to give to a particular cause through that means? So is cause a distinguishing factor? I mean, you mentioned that controversial causes may be more difficult. What are we talking about there in terms of controversial causes? What What isn't controversial today was extraordinarily controversial. For example, when we were starting, we did a lot of work in, in the... Uh, late 60s, early 70s on the gay rights movement. That was a very controversial movement. And, and you had to be very careful how contributions were solicited, whether people were called a contributor or a member. I mean, you, now today, that's not an issue. Just look at the Human Rights Campaign. It's a huge organization, and it gets support across a diverse base of the population, both in terms of age, in terms of uh, sexual orientation. So it's it's not controversial. AIDS was another one back in the in the late 80s. That was a difficult thing at first to raise money for. And the same with women's rights. I we help launch now and uh, the National Organization for Women. And that was not an easy thing to do in terms of getting mail out there or getting messages out there and having people publicly acknowledge that they're a member. Uh, so all this, all this changes. I, I don't think there's anything right now that's particularly controversial that needs to be done as quietly as it was done 50 years ago. But the, the, some, some of it is, is tougher. I mean, it's a lot easier to raise money for dewy-eyed puppy dogs in a rescue situation than it than it is for someone who wants to reform a police department. I mean, it, it just it, there's some things in our society that people find difficult to support or or more difficult than something that's so obvious. So it's it's a sort of a in vogue situation in, in a lot of this stuff. It start, starts to feel to me like everything is. Everything is game now for some constituency. Yeah. So yeah. you may not have everybody supporting your cause, but there are going to be enough people out there who are interested in what you're doing, even if it's just to counter another <laughs> group that's doing the opposite. You know, so no, that's true. There, because there's, there's always an opportunity to to reach a reach a tribe, so to speak, to get your yeah. Too many tribes, but there is. I mean, there's a lot. There are a lot of channels. There's lots of information. There's lots of ways to get information. There's lots of ways to respond, to give money now that, you know, you mentioned uh, years and years ago, it was the United Way. It was some of these other causes by mail and the church collection. That was that was the easiest. Yep. The, those were the three principal avenues for, for giving. Today, you have the GoFundMes. You have the old channels of direct mail and digital. You have newer channels of these installment plan giving, and there's there's lots of ways to give. And the blessing for all this new technology is that organizations that really know how to use it and pay attention to their donors really have an advantage because they can communicate very inexpensively to their donors and they can get their donors feedback very quickly but most organizations, sadly, are don't take advantage of this technology in terms of of sharing information and asking their donors to share information. So if there's if there's an age difference in in all this, is that the younger generations certainly want to be more involved than the older generations. the The older generations were they would give you the money, and they would say, "I trust you. Just take care of it." The younger generation is a show me generation. Show me what you're doing. Get me involved. Then you have my uh, support. Yeah. Well, that makes it a lot more difficult. I guess some of that is due, though, 
to the increased transparency that we see today, right? I mean, before things were happening, we just didn't see it. No, that's true. Today, things are happening and we see it. And so that we want to we want to make sure we're getting a closer look at it and monitoring what's going on, maybe in ways that you wouldn't have 30 years ago because you didn't know <laughs> today. You kind of know. No, that's that's absolutely true. There, there's there's also far less trust in, in yeah. institutions now than than there was. And that, that complicates it. The way to build trust is to be responsive to the people who support you and the people you're you're seeking the help from so that they that there is a two-way street of information not this top down send me the money i mean too many organizations continue to think of people who support them as sort of an atm machine and that that's not a good healthy way to build a human relationship what should a donor expect after they make a gift to a charitable organization through through a direct mail response? Well, they do, whether it's direct mail or any other channel, they should expect to be recognized for that gift, meaning they, their gift should be, they should be thanked for it. They should be recognized if they're regular givers over a period of years, recognized for their loyalty. They should be continually informed about the progress that the organization is making and on areas where they've requested funds. I mean, there are two questions a, a donor normally asks is, why do you need the money? And when I give it to you, will my gift make a difference? And so organizations really, the, the principal reason organizations lose members or donors is one, they do not show that they're accomplishing the mission. Two, they do not thank or recognize their donors. And three, they do not communicate in a consistent manner. So if you are an organization that simply is going back and back to someone asking them for money without ever reporting on how their gift has made a difference or why they are important and you know they're important, you're going to lose those people. And the biggest problem in mass fundraising is holding on to donors. We call it retention. It's, it's interesting. 75% of new donors who join an organization or give to an organization for the first time leave that organization by the end of the first year. That's, wow. a, that's an amazing statistic. And that's why fundraising tends for those types of organizations to be so expensive because you lose 75% of your investment at the end of the first year. Organizations that tend to their donors and uh, build relationships hold on to them. And by the second or third year, they're holding on to 70, 80 percent of those donors. And then that investment makes a lot of sense. But if you're not going to treat people well, there's nothing magical about this type of, of work. It's manners and common sense that you treat other people as though they are a part of the enterprise, which they are. Yeah. Well, one of the great things that I always felt you could do with a direct mail communication is that you could speak directly to a person with the content that you wanted them to know about. I mean, you have complete control over the message, which is one of the reasons why, Roger, and I'll tell you, we're probably the only watchdog that does this. We will check out these letters from time to time to make sure that they're truthful and accurate. Because we also know that if a person is going to rely on that letter to make a gift and and the vast majority of people who give that way are giving solely based on the content of that letter. They're not checking anything else out. No, no. They're that, giving because of that letter. No, that's absolutely right. So we think it's really important that those letters are accurate and telling the truth. What, do you, what would you say, though, are some of the key elements in a direct response to, in the content that goes into those letters? What are some of the key elements that need to be in that letter in order for it to be effective? The most effective fundraising letters are letters that are personal in nature, meaning they feel personal. 
that tell a story that that show a result in other words if you if you can tell a story in a human way an eye to you communication avoid a lot of statistics we have the biggest office in town we have the most phd's on our staff statistics tend to be a curse that, that far too many organizations fall under and not the expression of the human need and benefit that they create. So something that is written personally that talks about the needs of another person or the needs of whatever they're trying to meet and how that's been done and tells it in a story-like fashion, those are the important ingredients. And then, of course, the request for money and a request for money in a way that is sane, that, that uh, explains to someone why why this amount of money would be helpful and suggests amounts of money that are doable to most of the people on those lists. It doesn't do any good to not suggest an amount of money because people don't, people need to know, particularly new donors or people who haven't given before need to know what are you expecting? If that letter is, appeals to me, then the, the question becomes, what do you want me to do? I want to do something, but I don't know what to do. So the biggest enemy in any type of communication, but particularly in direct mail, is confusion. If I don't know what to do, I'm not going to do anything. And therefore, that expense of that mailing is made and there's no uh, or very little return. So the, the key ingredients are the ability to tell a story and to tell it in a personal way in human terms. Roger, we're about coming to the end of this, but I'd like to ask you about whether or not you could have seen or foreseen at the time when you were starting this, because I consider you one of the, or if not, I consider you the godfather of this whole thing. But could you have foreseen that this industry would have grown to become a vital part of our fundraising infrastructure and, and therefore the the social good that we do in this country is is tied to what you helped create all those years ago could you have envisioned that and by the way let me just say to our guests this doesn't exist in any other country <laughs> that i've seen I've, I've gone to a number of places and they talk about fundraising some use the internet very well they use email well and some use communications in radio and TV and so forth, but very few are able to activate their mail service in a way that you can produce this kind of fundraising. So could you have foreseen that we would have created this and where do you see it going 30, 40 years from now? I'm not that pressing. As a matter of fact, I, I remember when I took the job with John Gardner, a couple of my friends who had been, we, we all came out of the university fundraising background, and they, this one fellow says to me, Craver, well, how are you going to do this? Uh, no, this hasn't been done. And I said, well, we're going to ask lots of people for small gifts and raise lots of it that way. And I, how are you going to do that? Well, we're going to do it with mail. And he says, Roger, he said, no one ever got milk from a cow by sending it a letter. And so it wasn't, it wasn't a believable practice in those days. So no, I couldn't have foreseen it, but it sure grew fast. And we had a run to get the infrastructure and everything in place. And it, the, the techniques and the, and the research and all the knowledge that is behind what was direct mail is now direct response is a big body of scientific knowledge, now behavioral science. And that, this is going to keep growing and it's going to become more important because the markets get more niche, more finite, and you have to know entirely a lot more now to do this well. But yes, it's going to, uh, 30, 40 years ago, some form of this will still be very important. It may not be just paper and postage stamps and, and email. There may be, in all likelihood, will be other additional and important uh, channels that are used for that. But the technique of I talking to you with a specific request will not change. And worldwide, it, this, the, the use of direct mail has, has been 
fairly well developed in the UK and in Germany and the Netherlands and parts of Europe. But in terms of other parts of the globe, there is uh, the use of the telephone, there's the use of uh, door-to-door fundraising, street fundraising, and of course, the internet. So it's become a far more global set of practices now than it was just 10 years ago. That's good to hear. You know, governments can't and shouldn't be expected to do all this. And and so the, the role of the individual, I think, becomes increasingly uh, important. Well, you've been listening to Roger Craver, who I said before is the godfather of direct response in our country. And Roger has just given us a history lesson and a primer on direct fundraising, direct mail fundraising. I want to thank him for joining me today on the Heart of Giving podcast and say to all of you who were wondering where this came, now you know. And once you have the information, now you have to use it. So I'm hoping that for all our donors out there, when you see these letters coming in the mail, you don't just throw them away. Well, I guess you could throw it away if it's not an organization you care about. That's information for the charity to use. But also, I hope that when you do find those letters that are for organizations that you do care about, that you'll make that gift and and show them by your donation that you're voting for them to to get something important done in our society. So, Roger, thank you. Art, thank you. And thank you for what you and your organization do. Well, now, for all of you who are listening for the first time, realize that you can find us on all major podcast platforms. So be sure to share information about the show with your friends and relatives. You can also make a donation to the Heart of Giving podcast by going to give.org. And you can there make a make a donation. And I guarantee you that that money will be put to good use producing more informational shows like this one, evaluating charities that the public cares the most about and providing donors and charities with the information that they need to do good work. Thank you for listening. You've just listened to the Heart of Giving podcast with Art Taylor. Be sure to tune in next time for a brand new episode. To listen to our other interviews, visit heartgiving.podbean.com. That's heartgiving.podbean.com. Subscribe to our show on major podcast platforms. The thoughts and opinions expressed on this podcast are the views and opinions of the guests, not those of the BBB Wise Giving Alliance or program affiliates. This podcast is for information and educational purposes only and is copyrighted with all rights reserved. This podcast is protected by Podbean's Terms of Service.